Are you guys there in Luke chapter 21? You got your Bibles marked, Acts chapter 26 and Matthew 10. Beautiful. Luke 21, uh, we're going to go through verses 12 through 19. We are taking a long look at the Olivet Discourse. Uh, The Olivet Discourse is the Lord's prophetic message about the last days. And so last week we left off right in the middle of verse 12. And this, of course, will be uh, where we pick up today. So the driving theme in this section of scripture that we're looking at today is actually found in verse 13. So we're going to start in the middle of 12 and read uh, through verse 13. So let's do that real quick. The Lord Jesus says, You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. And that's it right there. That verse 13 is the key, I believe, to this section because the idea behind an occasion for testimony is for us and the uh, tribulation generation to be a witness of the truth. That's the idea, to be a witness of the truth, that God's people would testify to the truth of God, to the truth of who he is, to the truth of what he has done in the world, what he is doing in the world, what he will do in the world, and to the truth of what God has done for every single one of us personally. So to the world, truth is an elusive thing, isn't it? But God reminds us throughout his word that it's not truth that is lost, but people who are lost. The ministry of God's truth has always been crucial and essential in every age. And it will certainly be crucial and essential in the last days, um, you know, leading up to the tribulation and certainly in the tribulation. So this becomes the title of today's message, the ministry of truth. And so I just want to point out some things the Lord was showing me here in this passage regarding the ministry of truth. So look at verse 12 again. The Lord says, you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. So one of the ministries of truth is its opportunities. Truth's opportunities. It is designed by the Lord to give us opportunities to share the truth, right? Jesus says in Matthew 10, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And now here in this section of scripture, we see it is the Lord's intention that his truth, listen now, make it all the way to the highest level of government, to kings, to rulers, and I would say it includes, all, it includes all of those on the political ladder, right? That would include mayors, judges, governors, legislators, senators, all of those within government. Understand now, it is God's intention. It is God's intention to have a witness of truth before the rulers of men. It is his design. It is his intention. We see this even with the Apostle Paul. If you remember his calling, after the Lord literally knocked Paul off of his horse, blinding him for three days, you remember? The Lord tells this other man named Ananias to go and pray for Paul. But Ananias was afraid, right? Because Paul had this reputation that he was out capturing Christians, putting them in prison, and he was afraid. He didn't want to be one of those people. And this is how the Lord encouraged Ananias to go and pray for Paul. The Lord said to Ananias in Acts chapter 9, he said, Go, for he, that is Paul, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must enjoy, all the leisure he must have. (laughs) No, all the things that he must suffer for my name's sake. So we get to see one of those opportunities that Paul had when he was brought before King Agrippa. If you marked Acts chapter 26, turn to Acts chapter 26, and we're going to do a lot of reading, but I want you to bear with me here because this is a beautiful, a beautiful um, uh, example of exactly what we're talking about. Verse 1, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, 
You are permitted to speak for yourself. And so Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I'm going to stop there for a moment. Just so you know, this Agrippa, this is King Agrippa that Paul is standing before. King Agrippa is, uh, his great-grandfather was Herod the Great. He's the one that we learned about. He restored Zerubbabel's temple. And he's the one that tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. Um, That's his great-grandfather, King Agrippa's Grand uncle is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. And he's the one that Jesus called a fox in Luke 13. And then King Agrippa's father is Herod Agrippa I, who martyred the first apostle, uh, James, that is. And, and that's in Acts chapter 12. So this King Agrippa that Paul is standing before uh, in Acts 26 you know, he comes from a long line of Herods. He is actually the last Herod to rule in the Herod uh, dynasty. So again, in Acts chapter uh, 26, verse, 20, uh, verse 2, Paul says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all things of which I am accused by the Jews. Paul is standing before the king. He is having this opportunity. This is truth's opportunity for Paul. Verse 3, he says, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews, therefore I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation in Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue. And I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities." While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, isn't that interesting? I find that fascinating. Because I'm sure if you and I heard the Lord speak, it would not be in the Hebrew language that we would hear him speak in English, right? So Paul is just, he's fascinated that God would speak to him in the Hebrew language, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so I said, well, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things I which, uh, of which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Wow. Holy cow, that's, that is, what an amazing calling from the Lord. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying nothing different, no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. 
that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and he would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. You're going crazy. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But I speak the words of truth and reason for the king before whom I also speak freely. He knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escape his attention since this thing was not done in secret. It was not done in a corner. The whole world knows about it. So King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become, both, um, might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains that you have me in at this moment. And when he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with him. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man has done nothing deserving the death of chains or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Why? Because truth's opportunities have presented themselves to Paul. And, the, and Paul knows it. Paul is testifying to the truth of God, to the truth of who he is, to the truth of what he has done in the world, and to the truth of what God has done for him personally. Right? What a beautiful example of, of truth's opportunities. Now, the next thing that we see in the ministry of truth is, is its ministry of peace. Look at verse 14. The Lord says, Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Excuse me just a moment. I need to grab some tissue. So the word settle in the original language, it means to set or to put or to place, right? To, to put down or to lay down. Part of the idea is not to worry, which is why the NIV translates this verse, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself. But it is more than just not worrying. The idea, I think in its completeness, is to be at peace. It is to be at peace. It's the same word uh, used when speaking of Jesus being placed in the tomb. In Matthew 27, it says, When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped his body in a clean linen cloth and laid it. That's that word in the original language. That is, he laid it to rest, that it's at perfect peace. Part of the ministry of truth, everyone, is to put our hearts, your heart, your mind, at perfect peace even as, and especially as, you're standing in front of people and testifying of the truth of the Lord. Now, how is that possible? I want to tell you, it's possible. Uh, a large part of truth's peace is possible because it should come from truth's dependence, meaning God has made it so that you and I, we do not have to rely on our own wisdom that we can rely on God's wisdom and God's truth. You see, the Lord, he doesn't want us to, uh, he does not want his witnesses to be under any more pressure than they might already be as they're standing before rulers, right? So don't worry about what you're going to say. As Matthew Henry writes, he says this, instead of setting your hearts on work to contrive an answer to informations, to indictments, to articles, to accusations that will be exhibited against you in the ecclesiastical and civil courts, on the contrary, be at peace in your hearts. Settle it in your hearts. And as I think about this, I realize 
This has always been the Lord's counsel. This has always been God's counsel. Remember when Moses was coming up with reasons why he couldn't um, (laughs) speak for God? Do you remember that? Do you remember when he came up with this one? He said, oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue, right? Listen, I, I have had this argument with God. Me personally, Richard Priya, I've had this argument with God. When the Lord told me he wanted me to come out and to plant a church and to teach, I was like, Lord, you definitely have the wrong person, right? I think you meant someone else, not me. I was doing the Forrest Gump thing, Lord. I'm not a smart man, right? Lord, this is not me. And do you remember what the Lord said to Moses? Do you remember what he said? He said, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing or the blind, have not I, the Lord? Now, therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Teach you what you shall say. Isn't that interesting? Can't you just give me everything I need to say now? Do I have to be taught? See, that means that there's a process involved. Now, I don't want that process, Lord. I just want you to like, give it all to me in Revelation now and, and, and you know, so, that, so that I don't look bad. God, I don't want to look bad. Then I'm probably already looking, right? Do you remember what what Jeremiah said to the Lord? Jeremiah said, Lord, I can't speak. I'm just a kid. And you remember what the Lord said to Jeremiah? He said, do not say I'm I'm just a youth, for you shall go. You shall go to all who I am sending you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord, And then the Lord put forth his hand and he he touched my mouth and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Why? Because he didn't want Jeremiah and he didn't want Moses and he doesn't want us to have to worry about what we're going to say. He wants our hearts to be at peace, perfect peace. We don't have to rely on our wisdom. We don't have to rely on what we're, you know, the, you know, uh, what we're going to say to these accusations, we, we just need to rely on, on the Spirit, on the Holy Spirit. What the church needs to learn is if in the moment of trial that we don't know what to say or if we don't feel an unction to speak, then what should you do? What do you suppose? Then you don't say anything. And then that it's okay not to say anything. You see, if God is not giving us anything to say to our accusers, listen, everyone, then it might very well be because God has nothing to say to them. Isn't that a scary thought? That God has nothing, he might not have anything to say to them. May we learn from our Lord, whose position on talking was this. In John chapter 12, he says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, But the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. Think about how much we talk. Think about all the things that we say. How much of what we say really comes from the Lord? You see, the Lord Jesus demonstrated for us Here's the second person in the Trinity who probably has everything and the right to say everything and anything he wants only said what he believed the Father telling him to say. What to say and when to say it. Matthew records when Jesus stood before the Jewish council when he was being accused that he said nothing. In Matthew 26, it says, And the high priest arose and he said to him, Do you not answer nothing? Do you answer nothing? What is... What is it these men testify against you? And it says, but Jesus kept silent. Matthew records when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. And Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things that they are saying against you? But he answered him not one word. So that the governor marveled, it says, greatly. The Lord is demonstrating for all of us 
reliance upon the Father. He only speaks what and when the Father tells him to. Even the Lord did not rely upon his own wit, on his own ingenuity. The Lord's heart, everyone, was at perfect peace. We've seen truth's ministry of opportunities. It's a ministry of peace. And next, we're going to see truth's incredible, sharp incision. Look at verse 16. The Lord says, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. It's a hard word, isn't it? That's a hard thing to think about. Now, I know, even now at this moment, that there are probably many of you who just because you're a believer, you know, other parts of your family think you've lost your mind, you know, that they, you know, you're not close to them like you once were, or maybe they're so lost in sin, you know, when you guys get together. It's, it's difficult. It's hard. Listen, it's only going to intensify as we, as we go to the last days and as we are, you know, as, as the tribulation takes, takes on the world and takes on the apostate church, it's only going to intensify. But even now, at this very moment, the whole idea of truth and God's truth is under such attack. Universities are doing a very good job of attacking God's word and trying to um, break down you know, young believers. And, and it's a very tragic thing. But truth by its, its, its very own characteristic, hear me out now, is exclusive. It establishes a right and a wrong. Truth is not relative. One of the tenets of the false gospel preached by the woke church today is inclusivity. And that flies in the face of, of the Lord's own words recorded both, as we see here, but both by Luke and Matthew. If you have Matthew 10, Mark, turn to Matthew 10 and look at verse 34. The Lord says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or, more, or, or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life, listen, for my name's sake, will find it. I don't think that the Lord is saying that we need to be mean or that we need to be rude to the people in our family. I think the Lord is saying that we should be broken, that we should love them, that we should talk to them, that we should reach out to them. But at the very core of who we are, we cannot give up the truth of, of God's word and the truth of who he is and the truth for the next new philosophy that comes out of, you know, sociologists. And so it's, it's a very difficult thing. This sort of truth, we are told, it doesn't cut with a dull blade. Or it doesn't have rust on it. It doesn't leave an infection, but rather it is able, as the Spirit says in Hebrews, to pierce even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, that it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Listen, it's a surgical incision. Why is that important to know? Because when the Lord cuts the way that he does, he leaves an opportunity for healing. 
an opportunity for mending to take place, place properly when the time is right. So we see truth's incision, and next we see truth's promise. Look at verse 18, the Lord says, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. Not one single hair of your head shall be lost. Now, of course, I take exception to this uh, you know, verse. I'm like, Lord, what do you mean by that? Right? It can't mean what we think it means. So understand, this is a saying. This is an expression. It's not to be taken in a literal sense, right? Very similar to the Lord's say, uh, uh, the saying that the Lord uses earlier in his ministry as recorded by Matthew, Matthew 10. The Lord says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So the Lord's use of this expression as recorded by Matthew speaks of your incredible value, how valuable you are to God. Whereas the Lord's use of this expression used here in Luke's speaks uh, to the meticulous care that the Lord will take of your eternal soul and spirit. In other words, you will not be lost. It's an expression. So may the Lord help us to comprehend truth's ministry and its opportunities, its opportunities of peace and in its incision, its promise, that, and that we, may we be exercised now by its temperance. Look at verse 18. The Lord says, but by your patience, or by your patience possesses your souls. So let's just do this. Let's go back and let's start in verse 12, right in the middle of verse 12 again. Let's start at the top of verse 12 and let's read to the end. The Lord says, But before all of these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for, my, for testimony. So, so here's something that I've been saying over the last couple of messages and I just kind of want to clarify and, you know, uh, what I've been saying is that the, the, the tribulation is not determined for the church. It's, to, it's determined for uh, the, the, the nation of Israel and for the city of Jerusalem, right? And, and that is true. What I want to clarify is that it also includes the tribulation is determined for the world, and listen now, and for the apostate church. The apostate church are those who are pretending to be believers, but are not. And so, but here's what's going to happen. In the tribulation, people will get saved. People will come to Christ. And as I was saying last week, as they come to Christ, they're going to be looking for instruction from Christ. And where do you suppose they're going to find it? They're going to find it right here. So as, yes, the Lord is speaking directly to these men, to the apostles, but as I was saying last week, he's speaking to the future He's speaking also to the people, to that, to that tribulation generation. That's why it's worded this way. So that when they find it and they read it, the same way when you find it and you read it, and you're like, God is speaking to me personally. That's why he's putting it in the personal here. That when they find you, they're going to persecute you. They're going to deliver you. Right? That's, it's very important. But the Lord says it in verse 13, it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost by your patience possesses your souls. And so what we see there is that we need to be exercised by truth's temperance. Truth's temperance. This is the Lord's way of commanding us not to lose heart, not to forsake God's word, that we would remember to rely on God's word for wisdom and reason, not being swayed by emotions, because it's going to be emotional. 
life is emotional. And God's goal for us is that we are temperate, that we're not swayed, that we're not so, you know, excited that that we're losing our mind or that we're not so depressed that we're losing our mind. And as much as it is for the tribulation generation, this is the same for us now. So as this, and, and so how is that accomplished? Listen, everyone. It's accomplished by the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit, if I can have your eyes, if the same Holy Spirit that can deliver a young child like myself from being on drugs, from having to deal with all the, you know, the abuse that I went through as a child and all the things that I did and deliver me and deliver me radically. That same Holy Spirit can make us temperate and put our heart at ease and our mind at peace with God. But listen, it, the way that it comes is by us seeking him, by us waiting on him. He has to be our, our all in all. And we have to want him. I hope that makes sense. Because I think what happens is that Christians are, you know, they struggle with that thought or that idea. But here's what I would, I would challenge. My guess is that Christians aren't seeking God the way that they should. They're not seeking Jesus. They're not spending time the way that they should. They're out living their lives. They're being busy, you know, doing all sorts of things. And how much time, honestly, are we giving to the Lord? Are we spending time with him in the morning? Are we spending time with him in the, in the afternoon? Are we spending time with him in, in the evening? Right? And that we're waiting on God. That our lives are ordered around his will. His kingdom come. His will be done. That my mind is ordered by his word. His precepts. His truths. That my words are only spoken as I'm hearing him tell me what to say and when to say it, right? All of these things as my heart and my life is radically his because he radically died for me. Then I can be molded and shaped into his image. He can make me a temperate man, a temperate person. The Spirit says to the Apostle Paul to the church in Thessalonica, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. And here's the same principle, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion and in lust, like the Gentiles, like unbelievers who do not know God. The principle of possessing our own souls is just as applicable in trials because of our faith as much as it is true in sexual passion. That we know how to possess our own body and we know how to possess our own souls. Here's the Lord's word to us. Are you ready? Steady, everyone. Steady as you go. Steady. Don't give don't, you know, give to, this, to the left or to the right, to one extreme or the other. Don't overreact, don't underreact. Wait on the Lord. God is looking for us to be witnesses of the truth in word and in deed, in what we say and how we act. The ministry of truth will bring opportunities, peace, deep incisions. It comes with a promise. And if applied correctly, it'll bring temperance to our souls. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for...